her grandmother didn't want to go to Florida. She wanted to visit some of her connections in East Tennessee, and she was seizing at every chance to change Bailey's mind. Bailey was the son she lived with, her only boy. He was sitting on the edge of his chair at the table, bent over the orange sports section of the journal. Now, look here, Bailey, she said. See here, read this. And she stood with one hand on her thin hip and the other rattling the newspaper at his bald head. Here, this fellow that calls himself the misfit is a loose from the federal pen and headed toward Florida. And you read here what it says he did to these people. Just you read it. I wouldn't take my children in any direction with a criminal like that a loose in it. I couldn't answer to my conscience if I did. Bailey didn't look up from his reading, so she wheeled around then and faced the children's mother, a young woman in slacks, whose face was as broad and innocent as a cabbage and was tied around with a green headkerchief that had two points on the top like rabbit's ears. She was sitting on the sofa, feeding the baby his apricots out of a jar. The children had been to Florida before, the old lady said. You all ought to take them somewhere else for a change so they would see different parts of the world and be broad. They never have been to East Tennessee. <laughs> the children's mother didn't seem to hear her, but the eight-year-old boy, John Wesley, a stocky child with glasses, said, If you don't want to go to Florida, why don't you stay at home? He and the little girl, June Starr, were reading the funny papers on the floor. She wouldn't stay at home to be queen for a day, June Starr said, without raising her yellow head. Yes, and what would you do if this fellow, the misfit, caught you? The grandmother asked. I'd smack his face, John Wesley said. She wouldn't stay at home for a million bucks, June Starr said, afraid she'd miss something. She has to go everywhere we go. All right, miss, the grandmother said. Just remember that the next time you want me to curl your hair. June Starr said her hair was naturally curly. The next morning, the grandmother was the first one in the car ready to go. She had her big black valise that looked like the head of a hippopotamus in one corner, and underneath it, she was hiding a basket with pity saying the cat in it. She didn't intend for the cat to be left alone in the house for three days because he would miss her so much, and she was afraid he might brush against one of the gas burners and accidentally asphyxiate himself. Her son Bailey didn't like to arrive at a motel with a cat. She sat in the middle of the back seat. John Wesley and June Starr sat on either side of her. Bailey and the children's mother and the baby sat in front, and they left Atlanta at 8.45 with the mileage on the car at 55890. The grandmother wrote this down because she thought it would be interesting to say how many miles they had been when they got back. It took them 20 minutes to reach the outskirts of the city, his smooth, bland one. Occasionally, he gave her a faraway smile. They passed a large cotton field with five or six graves fenced in the middle of it like a small island. Look at the graveyard, the grandmother said, pointing it out. That was the old family burying ground. That belonged to the plantation. Where's the plantation, John Wesley asked. Gone with the wind, said the grandmother. Ha, ha. When the children finished all the comic books they had bought, they opened the lunch and ate it. The grandmother ate a peanut butter sandwich and an olive and would not let the children throw the box and the paper napkins out the window. When there was nothing else to do, they played a game by choosing a cloud and making the other two guess what shape it suggested. John Wesley took one the shape of a cow, and June Starr guessed the cow, and John Wesley said no an automobile, and June Starr said he didn't play fair, and they began to slap each other over the grandmother. The grandmother said she would tell them a story if they would keep quiet. When she told the story, she rolled her eyes and waved her head and was very dramatic. She said once when she was a maiden lady, she had been courted by Mr. Edgar Atkins Tea Garden from Jasper, Georgia. She said he was a very good-looking man and a gentleman and that he brought her a watermelon every Saturday afternoon with his initials cut in it, E-A-T. Well, one Saturday, she said, Mr. T. Garden brought the watermelon, and there was nobody at home, and he left it on the front porch and returned in his buggy to Jasper. But she never got the watermelon, she said, because a color boy ate it when he saw the initials, E-A-T. This story tickled John Wesley's funny bone, and he giggled and giggled, but June Starr didn't think it was any good. 
She said she wouldn't marry a man that just brought her a watermelon on Saturday. <laughs> the grandmother said she would have done well to marry Mr. Teagarden because he was a gentleman and had bought Coca-Cola stock when it first came out and that he had died only a few years ago, a very wealthy man. They stopped at the tower for barbecued sandwiches. The tower was a part stucco and part wood filling station and dance hall set in a clearing outside of Timothy. A fat man named Red Sammy Butts ran it, and there were signs stuck here and there on the building and for miles up and down the highway saying, Try Red Sammy's Famous Barbecue. None like famous Red Sammy's. Red Sam, the fat boy with a happy laugh, a veteran. <laughs> Red Sammy was lying on the bare ground outside the tower with his head under a truck while a gray monkey about a foot high chained to a small chinaberry tree chattered nearby. The monkey sprang back into the tree and got on the highest limb as soon as he saw the children jump out of the car and run toward him. Inside, the tower was a long, dark room with a counter at one end and tables at the other and dancing space in the middle. They all sat down at a board table next to the Nickelodeon and Red Sam's wife, a tall, burnt brown woman with hair and eyes lighter than her skin, came and took their order. The children's mother put a dime in the machine and played the Tennessee waltz, and the grandmother said that tune always made her want to dance. She asked Bailey if he would like to dance, but he only glared at her. He didn't have a naturally sunny disposition like she did, and trips made him nervous. The grandmother's brown eyes were very bright. She swayed her head from side to side and pretended she was dancing in her chair. June Starr said play something she could tap to, so the children's mother put in another dime and played a fast number, and June Starr stepped out onto the dance floor and did her tap routine. Ain't she cute, Red Sam's wife said, leaning over the counter. Would you like to come be my little girl? No, I certainly wouldn't, June Starr said. I wouldn't live in a broken-down place like this for a million bucks. And she ran back to the table. Ain't she cute, the woman repeated, stretching her mouth politely. Aren't you ashamed, hissed the grandmother. Red Sam came in and told his wife to quit lounging on the counter and hurry up with these people's order. His khaki trousers reached just to his hip bones, and his stomach hung over them like a sack of meal swaying under his shirt. He came over and sat down at a table nearby and let out a combination sign and yodel. You can't win, he said. You can't win. And he wiped his sweating red face off with a gray handkerchief. These days, you don't know who to trust, he said. Ain't that the truth? People are certainly not nice like they used to be, said the grandmother. Two fellas come in here last week, Red Sammy said, driving a Chrysler. It was an old beat-up car, but it was a good one, and these boys looked all right to me. Said they worked at the mill. And you know, I let them fellas charge the gas they bought. Now, why did I do that? Because you're a good man, the grandmother said at once. Yes, sir, I suppose so, Red Sam said, as if he was struck with this answer. His wife brought the orders, carrying five plates all at once without a tray, two in each hand and one balanced on her arm. It isn't a soul in this green world of gods that you can trust, she said. And I don't count nobody out of that. Not nobody, she repeated, looking at Red Sammy. Did you read about that criminal, the misfit that's escaped? Asked the grandmother. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if he didn't attack this place right here, said the woman. If he hears about it being here, I wouldn't be none surprised to see him. If he hears it's two cents in the cash register, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he... That'll do, Red Sam said. Go bring these people their cocoas. And the woman went off to get the rest of the order. A good man is hard to find, Red Sammy said. Everything is getting terrible. I remember the day you could go off and leave your screen door unlatched. Not no more. He and the grandmother discussed better times. The old lady said that in her opinion... Europe was entirely to blame for the way things were now. She said the way Europe acted, you would think we were made of money. And Red Sam said it was no use talking about it. She was exactly right. The children ran outside into the white sunlight and looked at the monkey in the lacy chinaberry tree. He was busy catching fleas on himself and biting each one carefully between his teeth as if it were a delicacy.